Hello everyone, this is Randy Malden with Supply Leaders Academy, RFX Academy, and Vendorful. And today we are going to be talking about reverse auctions. This is part of our education series we're doing over the holidays to help people better understand the RFX process, request for proposal, request for quotes, request for information, reverse auctions now. These are all tools that someone in the procurement professional field can use to save more money and generate more profits for their company. Many times we look like this. We are just beat up at the end of the day, happy and excited, but it has been a rough day because day in and day out it is us the procurement professionals defending our company's profits against the economy vendors and even the competition to make sure that we have everything we need to deliver on time in the right stuff right place right time as people need it we ultimately want a team like this that is happy and productive and reverse auctions is one of the ways we can do that because reverse auctions save money, which means more profits without increasing sales. That's important for people to understand, as well as save time, which means you can get more things done. You can get more accomplishments done. So you're not spending a lot of time in analyzing work. You've done the upfront work, and then you turn it on, and David will share with us a little bit later a story how a vendor was happy to participate in a reverse auction because they were able to get a lot of stuff done in a tenth of the time. And we end up transforming from daily crisis to predictable resources. And as you may have heard, when we invest in supply chain success, 2.5% savings equals the same amount of profits as an increase in sales of 10%. And if you understand the acquisition of a customer cost, how that can help you be a more profitable and even survive some very tough economic times. And companies that manage their supply chain are 73% more profitable than companies that don't and they realize a 40% return on their investment in supply chain projects and that's based on the research and even in my own experience I see that day in and day out because most people aren't looking at their supply chain they're focused more on sales and they don't realize that if they just turn a little bit to the right and look at their supply chain they can not only be more profitable but they can also serve their customer better as well with a better product our host your hosts for today are myself and Mr. David Wadler, the CEO of Vendorful. David, why don't you introduce yourself and let people know how we can help them. Sure. So, uh, I, as Randy said, I'm the CEO of Vendorful. We make software for, for folks like you, uh, helping companies with uh, other kinds of organizations like 501c3s and universities. Uh, save money and operate more efficiently. So, I would say that this is the... Uh, the <laughs> The presentation I'm most excited about, I think auctions are probably the most uh, exhilarating part of our product set. So I'm looking forward to diving in. And it's not only exhilarating for, for us, but it's also exhilarating for procurement when they start to save a lot of time. And that's a lot of what we battle against. Not necessarily cost savings, which is what's expected, but time, if we can do more stuff. And the approach we're going to have is techniques and tools. And I like to show this graphic because it represents me on a surfboard and my son on a surfboard. And believe it or not, I am the dog on the yellow bodyboard because I have an idea of what it takes to surf. I understand the equipment. But, you know, I'm not quite the expert. In other words, I've got the tools, but I don't necessarily have the techniques. Where my son, who is an expert surfer, when he gets on a surfboard, it's just like music. He gets out there and he can do things on a surfboard that most people can't. And it's a lot of fun to watch, but it shows that he has the right tools and the right techniques to make a big difference. And we're going to focus on reverse auctions today. And this comes into play when we think about what is our sourcing strategy. First is when we develop a sourcing strategy, we're going to look at a specific category. The category of what we're trying to buy, be it software or uh, a specific widget, a, a product, a thing or something like that, a category or a commodity. We're going to develop that category prof profile. Then we're going to look at the suppliers that fit within that profile. Then based on the suppliers and the category, we're going to develop a sourcing strategy. And this could be where we just go out and ask for an informal quote. We may do an in-depth request for a proposal, which we talked about in our previous webinar, or we might conduct a reverse, reverse, reverse auction that we're going to talk about today, and then we select an implementation path. Reverse auctions help us get to the right lever, and it helps us understand what the suppliers are going to be, make sure every visible bid is bid visible to 
everyone. It drives the price down. It's for those tangible goods. We're going to go a little bit more detail into those factors. And it requires a very clear statement of work that everyone understands and that everyone's operating and comparing apples to apples and bidding apples to apples so that we understand what the bid is. So that's what a reverse auction is. And the benefits are price transparency. You're able to see the pricing as it is in real time. It validates your price. So when you have bidders bidding to sell you something, it's validating the price they're offering because someone's willing to offer a lower price. We have productivity because we have a reduced cycle time. We can get things done faster. We have more suppliers getting involved, so we have more supplier participation, which is more increased competition, which tends to drive the price down to something that's more reasonable. Real-time supplier evaluation, and it compresses the price. Vendors don't like that part, but as buyers, we love that part. It drives that cost savings, increases that profit day in and day out. The criteria for a reverse auction is you want to make sure you have sufficient competition, meaning that you have multiple suppliers willing to participate in the reverse auction. Then you have very clear, specific specifications that everyone understands and can write and bid on so they understand what it is and what they're going to be expected to do. If you have to switch suppliers because someone beats another one, it's not a big problem. It's very easy to switch suppliers. Your quotes are technically economically comparable, again, comparing apples to apples. Or if you're going to do a lot, a lot of products for a lotting strategy, that everything is the same. So you want to make sure that it's easily understood, easily listed, so the suppliers can give you a realistic quote, a realistic bid. And we want to make sure that the savings that you're going to generate from doing the reverse auction far exceed the cost of hosting the auction. And once you'll see some of the examples we're going to have up here a little bit later, that is very easily done when you have the right things involved in the reverse auction. And the last criteria is that everyone needs to have access to the internet, which seems kind of common sense today, but you want to make sure it's known that people have the right systems because you don't want latency, which we'll talk about as well, to affect someone's ability to win a bid or force you to pay more than you could, you should have because something got stuck in, in the latency world out there, and we address that as well. The process is fairly simple. If you can remember eBay, when we would reverse, when we would do an auction bidding things up to buy something, well, this is just the opposite. We're going to figure out what are the requirements, step number one. What are we buying? We're going to develop the event in the system. We're going to invite those pre-qualified suppliers to participate in the auction. We're going to train them on how to use the system. So you want to make sure your software system that you're using is not clunky and hard to use. It should be where anyone can get involved and anyone can use it really easily. You're going to practice so you know that everyone understands how to use the system and how to participate in the auction. Open your event, communicate with your suppliers, answer questions, then close the event, analyze the results, and then award the contract. Now auctions are not unknown. We've been known about we've known about auctions. A lot of times we see it on the TV or in a movie. We have forward auctions that we see and reverse auctions, which we're going to talk about today. Forward auctions are those auctions you see on TV where someone's saying, okay, bid on this, bid on that, and they're raising the price higher and higher and higher. And the person who has the highest bid wins the item. It's very exciting to watch in the movies, and if you're participating in those auctions as well, it can be very exciting. I tend to get carried away in those uh, you know, charity auctions, but it's a lot of fun, and that's what they hope to do when you're driving the price up. They want to drive that price up. But as buyers, we want to look at the reverse auction. This is where we make a request to the suppliers, and they're placing the bid to reflect what they are willing to be paid for the item, meaning they're lowering the price, saying, okay, I'm willing to accept that. And someone says, well, I'm willing to accept a little bit lower, a little bit lower, and then the supplier with the lowest bid wins the business. And there's different styles of auctions, and we're not going to go into the different styles today. You can read that in the guide you got for uh, a guide to, our, to reverse auctions. You received that when you registered for this webinar. You can take a look at the different styles of auctions. And then we're going to talk specifically today about the open outcry and the ranked style of auction because that, was, that is what Vendorful does, and that is what Vendorful has produced results for its clients. Because when you have the right tools, you are going to be successful. What you don't want to be is this person. You don't want to be stressed, yelling at the computer, always fumbling over yourself and your partners and colleagues or fighting with vendors back and forth and mates you want to rip open your business, your computer and throw it out the window. Instead, you want to use a system like Vendorful where David is going to share with us 
some of the things that Vanderpool does to make our life easier as procurement professionals. So, David, let me turn it over to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. So, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna try to feather in some some anecdotes um, from actual customer stories. We just ran a, a monster of an auction uh, for a Fortune 500 company last week. Uh, it was a an eight figure auction, and so uh, it was. Very, very exciting. They were actually, uh, we were connected with them over speakerphone. They had 30 people in the room, uh, and there was cheering and hollering and everything else. So I don't know if I can convey all that excitement and enthusiasm here, but I, I'm going to give it my best. So really, what, you know, to what Randy was saying, uh, we want to make this very, very easy. Save everybody time. Save everybody money. You log in to Vendorful, you're going to get your dashboard. If you have any auctions that are in progress, or, or I shouldn't say in progress, but probably set up, ready to go, uh, you know, that'll be presented to you right away. But even if you don't, you can click the create a new auction button. Doesn't get much simpler than that. And then you're going to go through and set up uh, your settings. So I'm going to kind of talk through a bunch of the different criteria and whether you use a system like Vendorful or you use another one. Um, <clears throat> the, you know, a lot of this stuff should be fairly common where we do things that are a little bit different or distinct. I'll, I'll try to highlight that. But, you know, in the beginning, you're going to want to have some name for it. The name should kind of communicate uh, something. And then beyond that, you're going to offer a description, which is going to be a more thorough communication. Because when you're reaching out to the suppliers, even if you've done your homework, right, they need to know what it is you're buying so they are, you know, basically prepared and ready, you know, to, to accept and decide to go in. Quiet time is actually, <clears throat> excuse me, a very interesting thing. But we do it. Um, it exists elsewhere, but it is not something that you will see everywhere. Um, and so what quiet time is, and here it's a little little difficult to see, you'll see it's set to 60 seconds. So 60 seconds of quiet time, and you could set it to 120, which would be two minutes, or 180, which would be three minutes. Um, <clears throat> quiet time is the amount of time that needs to pass before the auction um, can close. So let's say you set an auction up and it's designed to run through noon, right? At noon, it's supposed to stop. <laughs> but at um, 11.59 and 45 seconds, somebody comes in and makes a bid. So what that will do is it'll basically reset the clock and say, all right, well, from this point forward, we have 60 seconds. And if nothing comes across the next 60 sec seconds, the auction will then come to a close or the lot will come to a close. Let's say 30 seconds go by. We're now at uh, noon and 15 seconds, and another bid comes in. What do we do? We reset the clock again to 60 seconds. And at this point, the auction goes into what's called overtime. And this continues on and on and on uh, until basically everyone's had their piece. And, um, or said their piece, I should say, or bid their piece, as it were. And the reason we do this is, you know, a lot of people go in with the idea that they're just going to wait and wait and wait. And at the very last second, right, they're going to try to undercut everybody. Uh, and, you know, no one's going to have a chance to reply or, you know, counter because, you know, the auction will expire. That sounds like a great idea. But the problem is that idea is not going to be unique to one supplier. They're all going to have that idea. And so what you need to do is remove the incentive for that to happen. So not only do we have a quiet time, we publish that. We share that data with the vendors so they know hey, those kinds of shenanigans won't work here. And the other thing it does for you as the buyer is it will create more competition. Um, <clears throat> there, there is a certain time pressure that people feel once you get into quiet time and uh, you oftentimes see the most aggressive bidding at the very end of the auction and then into overtime. So that, that will be set sort of at the, uh, at the macro level across the auction. Uh, then the next step in our, in our process is to uh, add people to your team. Uh, so these are all the people who can log in. You know, if there are you know, different workstations or different locations, these are all people who will be able to uh, set up the auction, watch the auction, you know, et cetera. And, and you know, we have different permissioning. So if you want to give certain people the ability to watch but not edit, uh, you, can, you can do that as well. And I just want to add, this is where getting that requirement right in the next couple steps, we talk about developing the requirements we're going to put in the reverse auction. This is important. 
as procurement, we don't develop those requirements, we just fill them. So inviting people into your team so they can give that input is very, very important so that you know you're bidding on the right stuff. Yep. Stakeholder engagement, uh, whether it's an auction or an RFX, uh, is, is critically, critically important. And one of the underlying principles that motivates the way we build our product. Right? So it's simplicity first, because we need to have people who are, you know, sometimes in certain businesses are called uh, the business owner or the um, stakeholder. Those people who are not necessarily in a procurement product every day need to be able to log into the procurement product and instantly feel comfortable and be productive. So this, uh, this is basically a, uh, a lot setting. So what a lot is, uh, you can have a multi-lot auction. And a lot is a grouping, a logical grouping of stuff. So uh, the auction we ran the other week where we had uh, 30 attendees, you know, cheering and, and hollering, uh, that was a multi-lot auction. There were two lots. One lot was for refrigerators, and the other lot was for freezers. And so in here, you will uh, set up a bunch of rules. You'll set up the style of auction. Uh, the options we have right now are reverse open, reverse ranked. It's very easy for us to add additional auction styles. So if people do come to us and say, hey, you know, for some reason I, I need to run uh, Japanese or Dutch, um, <clears throat> that stuff we can probably add in just a couple of days because we have built this on top of a, a framework that we've created. Um, <clears throat> and you'll go in and at the lot level now, right, you had a description for your auction. And then at the lot level, you're going to have another description. Uh, we want to buy freezers and this is what we're going to use them for, et cetera. You can set your currency. Uh, you can also set a starting bid and a, mid, and a minimum bid decrement. So those are optional. Um, the minimum bid decrement is probably the area which we should, we should spend a little more time thinking about. Uh, if you don't set anything, I think it defaults to, in U.S. dollars, uh, if you're using it in U.S. dollars, it'll default to one. I think it will just default to one of whatever currency it is you're doing. Now, if you think about the auction we just ran, which was, you know, eight figures with the, you know, average initial bids coming in somewhere in the 15 to $16 million range, uh, you probably don't want people reducing their bids a dollar a time. So you might set that to a thousand or $500 or $10,000. It's really probably going to depend on the size uh, of the items that you're buying for the, the cost of the items you're buying. So that is, that is under your control and it can be done at the lot level. And the other thing we're going to see in lots, if we go to the next slide, are the line items. So again, we'll just talk about the, the one we just ran. Um, in the refrigerators, they had uh, single door refrigerators that opened to the left, single door refrigerators that opened to the right, and dual door refrigerators, you know, where you can, you know, open each side. And they needed a quantity of, of each of those. And so in here, you can you know put in the name of the thing it is you you want the quantity the unit of measure do you want a box do you want a pallet uh, do you want you know per item and then at the bottom uh, you can put in additional information and that information I think in the other case uh, was was not about how to you know construct the pricing but um, about you know the parameters the refrigerator should be this size it has, should have these specific dimensions etc. Uh, in, in some cases, you might give a, even a reference model. We want a, an analog to something like this. And so that way, for each line item, right, now the example I gave, uh, there were uh, one lot of refrigerators with three different types of refrigerators, then a second lot uh, with freezers and three lots of freezers. And when you have a multi-lot auction, uh, the lots will typically run uh, sequentially meaning you're going to run uh, an auction, you're going to open the auction, you're going to run one lot, then you're going to run the other. You are not required to run them sequentially. You could, in theory, run them in parallel if you want, uh, but it really will depend on, on your specific set of circumstances. In this one, we have two lot auction. We're going to buy doodads and widgets. That's what you're looking at here. So moving on, you're going to want to set a start and end time uh, for all of this stuff. So these are non-sequential lots. You can see that the doodads would start at 1 and end at 1.30. And, there, you know, there can be some overtime in there. Uh, but overtime is typically not, not going to run 15 minutes. And if it runs too long, we can, you know, bump the start time of the, of the next lot if you don't want them overlapping. And if you don't mind if they overlap, then you don't have to bump it. And you can say, all right, well, 
I want to I want to rigidly adhere to the start time. And so, uh, yeah, this is you'll have kind of a the auction uh, timeline, right? From the time you set started your setup to each of your lots starting and ending, all the way through to the closing of the auction. And uh, next, you're gonna you're gonna add your your vendors. And so again, these are probably uh, people you vetted. I should actually add here uh, the the auction we just ran. Um, they follow. We really followed the best practice. They they ran an RFP first. Uh, they narrowed down the field, and in describing the auction, they they characterized it to the vendors as a negotiating process, right? And they uh, in this particular case ran a ranked auction. And as I, I promised, we will we will come back to why you would want to run a ranked versus uh, you know an open. And but they ran a ranked auction. And they said, look, we are not beholden to the best price. Right? We are optimizing for the best value, but rather than negotiating with you guys one at a time, we're going to do it in a group format and then save everybody a bunch of time. And so, you know, you might in certain scenarios have uh, a provider, let's again, I keep it here, you might say, all right, well, refrigerators are refrigerators are refrigerator it's fairly commoditized why wouldn't they just go for the the cheapest price well there are service level guarantees right there are warranties for the refrigerator so you know somebody might offer you a built-in three-year warranty and somebody else might offer a lifetime warranty uh, some might say you know what we can service any broken refrigerator within 24 hours and somebody might say well within 72 hours or a week so all of that stuff in this case was considered, which is why it's not necessarily going to go to the low bidder. Having said that, creating the auction or setting the auction up and letting it run does put uh, downward price pressure and you will save money. So uh, <clears throat> this is it. Uh, on the on the uh, other side of this, um, you will, as a, as a bidder, right, as a supplier, uh, be invited to an auction and you'll, you're going to get to see the overview. Uh, you'll get to see um, the uh, individual lots. So you'll see a widget lot. There are three items there and the doodads and you can click and, and get more information uh, and, and get specific line item level information. And we'll tell you the, uh, the type of the auction, etc. I, I mixed and match these uh, just for fun. So let's uh, let's keep moving along, and then the auction starts. And so, you know, what does this look like? Well, from the buyer side, this is actually at the end. Uh, you can see the top auction is concluded. But what the auction um, would really look like is uh, on the top uh, where it says auction is concluded. You'll see a countdown timer, and beneath that, you'll see a bats and baseballs, and then to the right of that, you'll see gloves and hats, and those are both complete. But you would see the actual amount of time. You would see whether a lot is open or closed. Um, like if it's not complete, right? It might be pending. It could be in progress. And to the right, you're actually watching this graph. And the graph are all the different suppliers and their bids as they're going down, 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 down. Uh, below this, we actually also have a table that shows you the real-time rank of the supplier uh, how much they've reduced their bid since their uh, initial bid as a percentage, and then by percentage, how far off they are from the lead. So let's move on. So on the other side, what do the vendors see? Well, as I said earlier, we need to make this really, really simple for people. So <clears throat> basically, all they have to do is there's a, it's a little obscured by the vendor bidding circle, um, but they're going to, you can see their current bid and then they just enter in, um, you know, their, their new bid, uh, beneath that underneath where it says vendor bidding, it will tell you, depending on the kind of auction, uh, it'll always tell you the next possible bid that you can make. Now, this is a good time to talk about the open versus ranked auctions, the difference in an open outcry auction, there is full price transparency with the leading price. Uh, by the way, over here in this one, I'll point out, you see bidding ends in 50.4 seconds. So that's what it looks like when there's an actual time in there. Um, so the the open outcry auction is the one that everyone here is going to be most familiar with from watching TV, right? The Picasso goes on sale and somebody says $22 million and someone says, I'll pay 23 and someone says, I'll bid 25. 
and, and it goes up and up and up. In this case goes down. I'll sell you those refrigerators for, you know, six million dollars. I'll do it for five point nine. I'll do it for five point eight. And you when you bid, you have to clear two thresholds. Number one, you have to clear the, the minimum bid decrement, right? So the minimum bid decrement is a thousand dollars. We know that you have to reduce the price at least a thousand dollars. And then the other thing you would have to clear is the uh, the leading price, right? So if you if you have a, a one million dollar bid, uh, it's your last bid, and the leading bid is nine hundred ninety nine thousand dollars, and you know nine 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 nine, right, all the way across. Uh, so they're a dollar ahead of you. You can't just undercut them by a penny or a dollar. You will actually have to reduce your your bid by a thousand dollars because there are two requirements, right? You have to beat them, and you have to to come down by a thousand. Now, if you are at a hundred and two thousand dollars, right, and the leading bid is a hundred thousand dollars, and say, well, I'm going to come down by a thousand because that's the minimum bid decrement. Well, in an open outcry auction, you have to beat the leader, so you would still have to come below. Now, in that case, you know, you could go in at nine 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 and beat the one by a dollar because you still cleared the one thousand dollar threshold. Uh, this can get a little bit confusing because I'm talking kind of quickly because I don't want to keep you all day. Um, if you have further questions, Randy and I are both delighted to uh, to spend some time uh, with you. You know, just contact us after this, and and we can talk through it more slowly. In the ranked auction, and and again, this will all be on display for the vendors. Right, we automatically calculate for them based on all the auction criteria. What is the next possible bid that you can make? It has to be you know at or below this number and if you don't put in a number that that is compliant you know, the submit button actually will shut off and if you put in a number that is compliant you can choose whether or not as the as the, as the bidder uh, whether you want to validate that you know have a pop-up and show it to you just submit it or warn you if you've come in way below um, in the in the ranked auction, there is less price transparency, but it creates a different sort of dynamic. There's a lot of game theory that goes on here, and I think perhaps none more so than when you're in the ranked auction. So the ranked auction will just tell you your rank. It'll tell you if you're winning. If you're not, it'll say something like you're ranked fifth, you're ranked third. It does not tell you how many other vendors are competing against you, right? So there are ways that you might discover it. We, we see sometimes that uh, you know, vendors will come in, they'll come in with an astronomically high number with the specific idea that if they're trying to be the highest price to start, because they want to kind of discover how many vendors uh, are in the auction. So they say, you're seven, they have a pretty good feeling that, you know what, there are probably seven suppliers. So we need to go in, you know, and pass as many as we can on the way down. And then they'll get bid very aggressively to try to discover each of the thresholds where the bids are. So in that case, you know, why would you want to do that? Well, you might want to do that in, in a case like the one we were just talking about with the refrigerators and, and the freezers, where you're not necessarily going to award it to the low bid. Because what would happen in there is you can have somebody who just is so much less money than, than everybody else, right? So let's say there, there are five suppliers. You have one supplier... And we're just going to come up with some numbers here. One supplier is going to offer those refrigerators for, for $5 million. The next closest bid, let's say, is $6 million. And then they're all pretty closely clustered. Six, six, one, six, two, six, four, something like that. And the first one, maybe they're willing to take a loss on the deal because it's going to open a new market for them or something. Well, no one else is going to bid, right? Because maybe the, the floor, right? Maybe it's break even at $5.5 million dollars. First one's willing to take the half million dollar loss. The other guys aren't. And so they won't bid, right? It's just, there'll be no bids. It's just going to go to the to the low price vendor. So when you have the ranked auction, right, it creates a dynamic. You are chasing the rabbit. You don't know quite where the rabbit is, but the rabbit's ahead of you. And so you might go down from six one to six and, you know, and keep kind of dipping your toe in the water. So it does create... Uh, this uncertainty does create more uh, more bidding action. All right, so, uh, but I digress. 
So in here, you're going to set up your uh, your initial bid. You're also going to you know decide whether or not you want to turn on your your safety. Uh, and you know again, that's the the additional bid validation. We we will do some validation to make sure that you are setting a bid that's legal. Uh, but you might want to approve your bid. Now, if you look over here, uh, off on the right-hand side, you'll see there's a little red thing where it says reset, and you bring your eyes just a bit north, uh, you're going to see something in green. I'm going to talk about that in a second. just wanted to draw your eyes to it, um, but we'll, we'll continue on. And here we are. So, you know, Randy talked about latency, and so this is something that we do. Again, I don't, I don't know that anyone else does it. Um, you know, we have a customer said that they had a whole lunch discussion about this because he had never seen it before and no one had even heard of it. What we do is we actually will detect the clock skew and what that means is how different the time is on your clock compared to the server. The latency, latency is uh, basically the time to get you know information from your, from your computer to our server and the jitter. And that is basically the uh, kind of the fluctuation in latency. Probably the, the most common scenario where you'd see jitter is, you know, you're doing this on Wi-Fi and, you know, people start watching YouTube and Netflix and all of a sudden, you know, your bandwidth has gone down. So your latency has gone up, right, because other people are using it. Or you're doing it in an auction laptop from one room to another and then you move back and you'll see, you know, your latency is, you know, moving up and down all over the place you would have a high jitter number. So what we're able to do in our system is basically account for as much of this as possible. Now jitter, we're really just going to tell you what it is, and it's on you to minimize that. Um, but we have a very, very, uh, you know, we use a particular programming language that's very, very good at uh, minimizing latency. And where clock skew is concerned, that's super important because the most frustrating thing you can imagine, and, and frankly unfair thing you can imagine, from the perspective of the of the bidder, and all Randy and I are are each bidding to win your collective business, and, and I bid with um, well, actually the thing is the thing is running down. My clock is two seconds fast, so two seconds before the actual end of the auction, let's say my screen refreshes and it says the auction's complete because as far as my computer knows, right, the auction's done. Meanwhile, in the remaining two seconds, Randy hits click, he hits submit, the auction goes into overtime, the five other suppliers, they start bidding like crazy, you know, the price goes down, down, down. As far as I know, like, the auction's over, and when I last saw it, I had the leading price. And so that is, you know, obviously going to be bad for me as the bidder. It's also going to be bad because, you know, I might be the most motivated vendor to win that business, and I am no, no longer in the auction. So that's going to be bad for the buyer. So one of the very first things we did is we said, how can we solve that problem? And so we do that by basically measuring the clock skew and then baking that in and accounting for it uh, dynamically. So when you're done, let's go back to the to the buyer side. Um, you know, that table you, you saw before, uh, sorry, the graph you saw before, that, that's always available to you at the conclusion of the auction and during the auction. And then uh, in here, uh, you can also see the um, the different, uh, what's I going to say, the, the, you know, all the different line items and, and lots. And we'll, you know, show you for each bidder, right, every vendor, and then we'll also show you at the bottom kind of the, the best of the best uh, by lot and line item. So this is the, the teaser. Let me let me just give uh, one other quick anecdote. Um, so Randy mentioned earlier that, uh, you know, we had a vendor who was really excited about this. So we were working with a university, uh, and they were buying um, a particular product for dormitory rooms. And, um, you know, the nice thing about running these auctions, by the way, is typically when they, they run the auction, they don't just pay for, the auction doesn't just pay for itself. The auction will usually pay for one or many years <laughs> of, our, of our entire application suite, right, in, in one shot. So, you know, the example of the refrigerators and freezers, we think that savings was probably going to be about a million dollars all in when they, when they finally decide. And uh, our product costs well, well under a million dollars. So the many years of the product effectively pays for itself. But uh, in the case with this university, you know, buying stuff for the dorm rooms, um, they ended up sticking with the incumbent vendor. 
they saved 15% year over year. The previous year, it was about a six-week negotiation to get to what they thought was the rock-bottom price. So when the vendor called us, I expected to hear, oh, you people, you're ruining my margins, this is terrible, etc. Instead, he heard, how can, how can I help you get into more universities? And I said, well, okay, that's, uh, I'd love to talk about that. How could, what, why would you want to do that? He said, because all the negotiation was done in an hour. Do you know how much time I freed up? If I could just do this with, with every university, I could do so much more business. So I'm not going to say that that's the typical response you're going to get from a vendor, uh, but I, I can tell you that not all of them are going to be extremely upset uh, that you're trying to negotiate on price using an auction. And floor is yours, Randy. And then, this, as you mentioned, this is the teaser for contract management, which we are going to do in our next webinar next week. We're going to talk about the contract management part of how do you manage your contracts to get more value than what you've actually negotiated for for the long term. And that involves not only managing the contract, knowing when to start your contracting process or RFP process, but then after the contract, how do you manage performance? Use that leverage of evaluating performance to get more value from your clients or your vendors so that they want to win your business again and again. And as you can see, simple tools equal simple success. As our education series continues, next week will be our contracts management. But right now, you're probably wondering, what are your next steps? Well, your next steps is simply set up a demo and get a course. Get RFX Academy, where we go into detail into all of these areas, basically how to set up your procurement department to get more savings and generate more profits for your company. Just reach out and contact us. Go to rfxacademy.com, register for Vendorful Demo. We have it right there on the webpage. Go to rfxacademy.com, look at the top, you'll see register for a demo, or reach out to me on LinkedIn, or David on LinkedIn, we have our phone numbers below as well. Just give us a call, say, hey, I'd like to see Vendorful, and then we'll get you into RFX Academy. RFX Academy is five different courses. Where we talk about request for proposal, reverse auctions, contract administration, vendor management, and category management. That is your ultimate certification where you actually complete a project to show the savings that you're generating for your company being more profitable. And it's very simple to do. Just simply go to our website, ask for a demo, reference this presentation, complete the demo, and then you're going to get access to RFX Academy for six months. So go ahead and start thinking about some questions as I share with you our contact question, our contact information some more. And, you know, other than that, I think it's a wonderful demonstration of reverse auction. It's, it's kind of a, a, a secret that a lot of people don't do because a lot of people like the uh, we call the fixed price contract but if you use other tools other RFP techniques reverse auction you can get a lot more value for your dollar and that's what it's all about at the end of the day for a private company getting more value means you're more profitable for our public entities and nonprofits getting more value means you get to do more stuff and when you get to do more stuff you get to serve more people and make a difference for your company and your organization with that David do you have any other thoughts or comments uh, I think uh, no, that's, that's pretty much it. I, I, I will say um, if you are going to do uh, reverse auctions, I, I you know highly recommend you get popcorn because uh, it, it, it's a spectacle and they are extremely, extremely exciting to watch. It's like, it's like watching an action movie. And imagine that, though, and, and it's fun to watch, and you're getting more stuff done because you don't have to spend as much time as you've done in the past. With that, I really appreciate everyone sharing their lunchtime or afternoon time with us today. We want to make sure we kept it under an hour, but definitely go out, set up a demonstration. Go ahead and even set it up for next year as we're coming into the holidays. I know you're busy. You know, set one up for January or even February so that we know you're interested. We can set you up, and then as soon as you get that done, we're going to get you to RFX Academy so you can start applying these techniques. Whether you use Vendorful or some other system, the techniques make a difference, and then when you get the right tools like Vendorful, it makes a huge difference. Huge difference. With that, have a wonderful day. Take care, and we'll talk to you soon.